one or possibly two, depending on the time since we're rushed. Um, ontologies that we've developed here and we're using within the sensors domain. Um, so, are you guys familiar with the sensor web enablement languages? Do I have that right? Vaguely. Um, vaguely. Yeah. Um, but know of their existence mainly, not not so much the structure and that kind of thing. Okay. So basically, this ontology I'll show you is um, um, it's taken directly from uh, a language called Observation and Measurements. So this is a language within the OGC Sensor Web Enablement Group, um, mainly dealing with how to represent um, observations themselves. Um, and this is the basic structure of, of our model. Um, these are just the high-level concepts we're dealing with. So everything centers around this thing we call an observation. Um, and so an observation is basically an act of measuring some phenomena in the world. Um, and that phenomena is called a property, and it's related, the observation is related to the property through this observed property relationship. Um, now, this measurement actually is conducted by a sensor, um, which within OGC sensor um, ML speak is actually a process. So a process is something with inputs and outputs. Um, and they define a sensor as such. Um, and so the, the connection between observation and sensor is through this procedure relationship. Yeah? And observations have, you know, particular locations. They took place somewhere, right? And they have sampling times. So they took place at some point in time. Um, the result is the actual value of the measurement um, of the phenomena that took place. And the feature of interest is the actual thing out there in the world that we're measuring. We're measuring the phenomena, but the phenomena is a quality of some object or event or situation in the world. Um, and that's what we're, we're relating to with the feature of interest. So these are just the, the high level concepts. <clears throat> So if you guys want to play around with the ontology while I'm talking, you can go to this site here. If you, I don't know if you have web access. Um, but if you do, if you go to noesis.write.edu uh, forward slash researchers forward slash Corey forward slash ONT forward slash observation.al, it's uh, up on the web. And you could download it and load it into Protege. How do you increase the volume? Yeah. This right here. So it's this right here. So um, I'm not sure if Satya showed you how to load ontologies like this way, but if you went to um, File and went to New Project, um, I'll check up here. so okay. if you opened up Protege, went to New Project, um, create from existing sources, uh, Al RDF file, click Next, and then within this box here, you just type the URL. And hit OK, and it'll it'll open. Safari, I imagine you can export straight out of this too. I'm sorry? You can export your graphical version of your ontology into the XML that it's based out of the tool. Um, yes, the yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just a nice, it's in XML yeah. or in right. some nice format. It. It's just a nice GUI yeah. to represent, yeah. Is it Al the L for? Yes. <clears throat> okay, so these are 
the major classes. These are probably the ones that I just showed you within the. Um, is it okay? Within the graphic before, so um, we'll start with this this term observation. Um, so an observation is an act of observing some property or phenomena with the goal of producing uh, a value of that property. Now, most of these terms, like I tried to stick fairly closely with um, the structure, the, uh, the, the structure and terminology used within the O and M OGC languages. So these are the um, major relationships within the observation cl class. So there's a feature of interest relationship to a feature. Um, should the classes just come up with the URL? They should just come up. Well, you might have to do a couple next, like yeah, you yeah, said, with yeah, the yeah, DL. Okay. Right. Um, and then it might start within the metadata screen. So you might have to go over to the classes tab. Yeah. Can you help them? Okay, so, right, so we'll start with feature of interest. So this is the concept which relates the observation to the object or event or situation that's out there in the world. Um, so this is this concept here. So it's, it's an abstraction of some real world phenomenon. Um, so within this, this feature concept, we have properties carrier of characteristics and property value provider. So carrier of characteristic is basically those phenomena that are associated or attributed to uh, some object. So this table would have a color and have some form, um, some measurable qual qualities uh, that a sensor could um, detect. Um, and then it also has a property value provider. This is an inverse relationship from the feature of interest relationship. So this actually points back to the observations that detected this particular feature. So there's several types of features we can we could talk about. One is uh, coverage. So coverage is within OGC speak uh, a spatial temporal area, um, I guess. So an, a landmass or some uh, area of air that we're measuring for temperature, for example. Um, and the other is entities. So these are actual things, you know. So we break entity down into objects and events. Um, and these objects and events have locations. And then within the particular domain that we're interested in, we were looking at weather um, data. So we were interested in wind storms, wet winter storms, these types, types of events. Um, you'll, you'll notice that I use this namespace that's not on the other concepts called weather. And that's because these concepts here with this particular weather namespace are not part of the observation ontology. Um, they're more an extension within the domain of weather. Like you could use this observation ontology within many different domains, not just weather. So we wanted to make that explicit. So for, uh, if we're looking at windstorm, um, there is a, a has value restriction saying that a windstorm must have this quality of wind speed, right? So, and winter storm, for example, must have a, an air temperature quality that we can measure. Um, Corey, I imagine you just link the other ontologies by their, their URL. You just, did you physically do that here in this case? The <clears throat> weather ontology? So in this case, we just extended the observation ontology. Okay. So um, we could have an external weather ontology that we brought in, and that's how we would do it. In this case, we just took the ontology uh, base, and we extended it with the concepts we needed um, for this particular application. We didn't really have a good weather ontology to start with, so we just we did the extension. Um, so as we go down the hierarchy, we get more and more specific about the types of storms we're looking at. Um, so freezing rain would be one type, and you'll see um, in addition to just air temperature, we also say freezing rain 
um, must have a, a precipitation quality that we can measure. Um, a snowstorm has uh, a snowfall quality that we can measure. And then we can get more specific and talk about um, blizzards and flurries. So each one of these also have a wind speed, um, a wind speed quality that we can measure. So we can actually use these, we're using these um, qualities, these restrictions on the classes to determine um, what sensors can actually detect different types of events, right? So if we wanted to say, you know, what sensor could we use to actually detect a blizzard? Well, we would have to say um, a sensor or a group of sensors that could detect these qualities. Um, so the reasoning here is fairly straightforward. It's uh, all in the model of how to, how to do that. So going back to observation, um, an observation has a particular location. So this would get into some of the spatial uh, things we want to do. Um, in, in this particular case, a location is simply a geometrical point with longitude, latitude, and elevation. Um, I'll probably show you later uh, an extension of this where we're using named locations. So Wright State University or airports and those kind of things that come from another ontology called GeoNames. So this is a, a resource up on the web that has standard locations, and we use those. Um, and we, we um, reference them from this ontology. The third property we look at is uh, the observed property relationship. This is the relationship between the observation and the actual phenomena that's being measured. Um, so in, within OG Speak, it's called the property type, but they're phenomena. Um, so there's several um, more complex property types that we can aggregate together. So there's something called compound property types. So if you want to take several phenomena and group them together and name these and use them in a certain way, um, for example, color, you might want to call as a, a property. Um, but color could be defined as a spectrum along the, you know, or an interval along the, spec the color spectrum. Well, you, you could use this by um, using the compound property type to define that spectrum. Um, another is constrained property type. So if we wanted to say that some phenomena um, within a particular situation. So temperature, for example. Um, you can measure the temperature of water or air or many different things. Um, so for example, if you wanted to just talk about water temperature separately from air temperature, because the sensors you use are very different, um, you can put this constraint on the temperature to, to specify that. Um, So basically, you can constrain the phenomena based on the types of features that it is a quality of, for example. So here, the constrained base would be the phenomena, so the temperature. Uh, the substance is the feature that you're constraining it by. So this would be uh, water or air or something to this effect. And then we have different types of phenomena from our, our weather um, terminology. So we're working with precipitation, uh, pressure, radiation, uh, temperature, wind, speed, um, wind properties, those kind of things. So wind speed, wind direction. And finally, um, we have this relationship from the observation to the sensor itself, or to the process um, that generated the observation. So, so the process is defined is a, it's a method, algorithm, or instrument, or some system of these. So as I said, it's anything with inputs and outputs. So inputs and outputs of a sensor would be you know some phenomena with some result data. Um, and the 
the inverse relationship from the sensor to the observation is called generated observation. So you can see we define the inverse of the procedure relationship here. <clears throat> there is a particular ID, which is just a data type, um, a name given to each particular sensor. Um, the parameter, this is the phenomenon that is capable of measuring um, the location uh, of the sensor and the valid processing time of the sensor. So when is it out there in the world and capable of making measurements? And most of these subclasses of processes um, come from the sensor model language. And most of them don't deal with sensors, but deal with more of the algorithmic processing of the observational data. So for example, if you, if you got in the data, but you had to analyze it in several different steps, like along a workflow, for example, you could describe that entire workflow within this process chain um, concept. So using you know, your partonomical relationships, you have process chain, um, which has different component processes. Um, uh, data sources are processes without an input. So th these are the base sources. So if you wanted to grab um, observations from the web, for example, or from a database, and, you know, then th this would be a data source. Um, a system is uh, a collection of these processes, uh, a collection of sensors that work together in certain ways. So in the weather domain, you, we always talk according to systems. It's always multiple sensors out there detecting multiple different phenomena that we group together to de detect the weather in some way. And then under component, we actually have the base, base sensors. And these are the, some of the types of sensors we are, we are currently using. So precipitation sensors, pressure sensors, radiation sensors, wind sensors. Right. So uh, a sensor is capable of generating an observation. Um, and we, here we have um, the universal quantifiers on the generated observation relationship. Um, to uh, a precipitation observation. So w what we're saying here is that if a precipitation sensor makes a measurement or uh, makes an observation, that observation must be a precipitation observation. Or, or what we actually say in reverse, if we have a precipitation observation, then we can be sure that that actually came from a precipitation sensor. Um, and this is actually useful when we actually have incomplete data. So say for example, we have you know, some data coming in, but we don't know what type of sensor it came from. We do know what type of observation it was. Well then we can automatically classify that sensor um, using these particular constraints. So and we can also go the reverse um, using some other ways. But. So actually using these for classification and for filling in um, voids in the data is useful. <clears throat> and similarly, similarly, we have a, a parameter, which is the relationship to the phenomena, and we say that it must be a precipitation property. So this precipitation sensor must detect, um, you know, either, you know, a snowfall or visibility or soil moisture or something within within this grouping here. Okay. So we have a relationship to the result. So this, you know, we started out just saying, well, the result is just some, you know, numerical value, right? Um, but it actually can get more complex than that. So there's actually several types of results you can have. So we can have um, category results, count results, um, truth results, or measure results. Um, so for example, count, if our observation is just to know how many people are walking through a hallway, then that, you know, we're just counting something. If we just wanted to know if something occurred or not, that would just be you know, a truth, truth data. For the most part, we deal with measure data, though. So these are. Um, 
actually have float values, so you know um, they have a unit of measurement that we're using, and also a belief value. So this belief value is one of the major reasons we actually had this as a separate concept. Also, so we can add the unit of measurement as well. Can you, when you set up the the data type you have there, like a float or whatever, mm -hmm. can you um, specify a data type that you, you might not be able to support in Protege? Like for example, like a point cloud or a geometry or <clears> something <throat> like that? You would have to actually model that. So there are several um, data types that are allowable. So that you can see those here. So I constrained my data type to float here. Right. Um, and some others are Boolean, int, string, date, date time, and some others. So if I wanted to make it of type geometry, I would actually have to create a class to describe it. <clears throat> right. And we actually Can the range be a class? Absolutely. It's, it's an object property at that point, right? Okay. Yeah. Right. So we um so for example the location, that's how we did it, right? So we said a location is a geometry and then a point is a type of geometry, right? That's about the extent to which we got in modeling this, but this actually came from like the GML languages, if you're familiar. Okay. So yeah, I mean these are common, and if you wanted to do more um, expressive spatial reasoning and spatial representation, you could just extend these. Yeah. And the primitives, though, you can actually create new primitives. Um, are you talking about like um, talking about regions and then well, re mean, developing like regions string, as string integer and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. If I have the what if I have something that's not listed there? Like for example, if I'm working with data in Oracle, they have more than just strings and hints. Mm -hmm. Could I list that as well? <clears throat> there are um, spatial ontologies, or at least there, there's people working on these to represent those more complex structures. That, that you want to work with. Uh, I'm not as familiar, okay. but uh, yeah, there has been work done. Yes. So, you know, different types of polygons or, you know, these kind of things, you can represent those. Right, so. Yeah, in addition to the value, the unit of measurement, we have this belief value. So this is, you know, sometimes useful in, you know, applications. It's having some representation of the trustworthiness of some measurement you have. Um, and that's where we, where we um, store this particular value. And finally, there's several time uh, relationships here. And these actually are used for two different purposes. So result time is the time in which um, uh, it's the time in which a, a particular value or measurement is used. So or, for example, if you, you take a measurement and then you wait a little while to analyze it and then put it out there, it would be the time in which you actually analyzed it and used it. Um, Probably the more useful is something called sampling time. So this is the time when the actual um, measurement took place, like in the real calendar clock type of definition. Um, right. And within time, we have several um, concepts. Um, so there's a, actually an ontology specifically devoted to representing time called Alton. Um, and they make this distinction between in intervals and instants um, and how to reason between intervals and instances. So you have contains relationships and overlaps relationships between intervals. Um, so if you have more complex observations that actually span uh, a large amount of time, if you're taking temperature every five minutes or something like this, um, you can represent that, those kind of things. Uh, more complex observations. But here, you know, um, our observations occur within a particular instant, and then we can talk about instances within intervals. Okay. So that's, that's the basic uh, O&M ontology. Um, 
as I said, it's almost taken directly or as close as I could get to the O&M. Um, we've actually done further development on particular classes like, um, let's see. So you can have more complex observations, as I said. You can group observations together in certain ways. So we actually took this time series observation, which is says um, it's uh, defined if the member observations have the same feature of interest, the same observed properties, and different sampling times. Then we can group these into something called a time series. So if you're um, you're always measuring temperature on the same you know, location um, at different time periods, well, then you can group it into here. The problem is this definition, member observations have the same feature of interest, the same observed property in different sampling times. This is a fairly complex thing. Um, and there's no way to do this within the XML um, OGC languages. It's just too confining. Um, so what we did is we, we took this definition and we can express this to some extent within the OWL. Um, if we have time, I can show you more. It's a bit more advanced, but um, just showing the utility of using these more expressive languages. So, as it stands, if you want to use the OGC languages, you just have to read the spec, and when you encode your data, abide by what it says in the text here. There's no real structural constraints to make you do this kind of thing. And this is written in OWL, stored in IDF. Is that <clears throat> it's the, so what I'm showing you is the schema itself. It is stored in OWL. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the the data is normally stored in R, in the RDF language. The data right. mm -hmm. is stored in RDF. Mm -hmm. So that would be the instances right. are stored in RDF. Mm -hmm. But the actual structure is stored in OWL, mm -hmm. which is like a text, its own text. Yes. XML. No, no, it's fine. <clears throat> well, it does have a. XML serialization, true. Which is the file we would download. Mm -hmm. Right, it's this right here. Okay. If you really want to look at it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's basically what I want to talk about. Um, very briefly, I'll say that there is work. So this is what we, we generated for our own purposes. Um, there's also a, a W3C incubator group to actually define a standard sensors ontology. Um, and uh, th this work being done here, so um, so the way they define it is there's some sensor device, it has observations, um, and then they define the capabilities, the processes, and the physical properties of it. Um, so here's a more useful description. Um, let's see. So this ontology, so the ontology I showed you was mostly about the observations. I mean, it did have some concepts um, related to sensors and processes, um, but mostly it was observations. This one is more along the lines of modeling the actually hardware of the sensor itself, um, and not so much the observation. So they do have a concept within the ontology called observation, but as you can see, it's completely empty. There's really nothing beyond. Um, So here we have this concept of sensor. Um, it has some operational model. So this would be the processing that it goes through. Um, it measures some phenomena, and it supports some sensor grounding. So it's attached to some, um, 
it's, it has some attachment. It's somewhere in the world, these, these kind of things. Um, I just want to show you this quickly um, because it's just to show the differences. Um, so here we get a lot more into the particular accuracy of, of the sensor, the, the language bindings of the sensor, calibration type things of um, the sensor. Um, The mobility of the sensor, uh, platforms that the sensor can be based on, um, these sort of things. So the idea is to take these two and kind of bring them together. So I think that'll be kind of the best of both worlds. You know, we have this expressive description of the hardware itself and the expressive description of the observations. So that's kind of the next steps we're doing. Any questions? Let me go deeper into any particular aspect. Okay. Okay. We're running a little behind, so I'll go ahead and let Ajith talk. <clears throat> This one, right? Should I wear it? Sure. I here? Okay. So, uh, let me actually uh, quickly. Uh, I'm allocated one and a half hours, but I'm very sure that I'm not going to take that long. So, uh, I'm going to talk uh, quickly about annotations. So, this is, it probably will seem like slight uh, change in the course, but uh, you'll see when it uh, comes to uh, uh, attaching ontologies to, uh, you know, the existing data sources, annotation is the way to go. So I'm going to talk about annotations in the web, basically why and how, and let's see whether this works. Yes. So, oops, there's some uh, thing on the top. So. Uh, this is a quick uh, take on who, uh, what my background is because I'm not exactly a, a ontology expert or you know, th that sort of thing. I, I was a software engineer in a previous life, so uh, I have uh, the proudest experience, the achievement I have is be being a member of the Apache Software Foundation and uh, I've been involved in uh, building these uh, web service stacks. So I'm a primary author of Apache Access 2, and so I have worked closely with XML schema and WSDL, and I actually used to sit next to the actual author of WSDL for some time. So it's all in a previous life. So, <laughs> and my current research focus right now is I'm as my software engineering skills go, I I'm very interested in service-oriented architecture, and. Recently, I've been interested in cloud computing, especially the aspects of cloud computing that involve services. So I'm slightly a different uh, uh, expert on this uh, thing. Um, so before we go on to the web, 
just forget the web for now and think of what really is an annotation. What do you mean by annotation? If you don't have the World Wide Web, an annotation is something like this. So whenever your professor gives back your exam paper, it will have all these red markings saying, oh, this is wrong. No, this is, you should take a look at this. Oh, if you, when you are studying on, on your notes, you will highlight portions and, you know, draw circles and do, uh, write things. So all these things are what we call annotations in the real world, right? Like a real world meaning regular life without having these cyber things into it. Now, when it comes to, you know, just g giving you an abstract idea of what an annotation is, it's basically a highlight of pieces of certain data items and you may have certain metadata attached to it that says what it is or what kind of relevance it is to you uh, and so on. Now, when we go to the World Wide Web, there is an inter interesting uh, uh, use of annotations too there because you can, just like you make these little notes on your uh, uh, lecture notes or on exam papers or whatever, you can do the same for web resources. So, uh, Delicious, for example, it's called social bookmarking, but if you think of it, it's actually adding these little annotations to web pages because you are not actually changing the web page. You are just, you know, marking up certain things and say, oh, this piece is interesting. This is about this one. So, there is some use of annotations in the World Wide Web. Now, when it comes to the world of semantic web, we talk about annotations as well. The uh, primary use of annotations in the world of semantic web is to create the link between the ontologies that you've been talking, talking about the, the whole morning to the existing data sources that have no clue about these models existing. So the link meaning the the, uh, the model that you are linking to mostly is an ontology, but it does not need to be. It could be a, a, a meta model. So, so the word semantic meta model, we use it to encapsulate all models that you might link to. So, so a, a vocabulary, just, just a certain, certain set of agreed upon words may also be taken as a model. So there are such models in, in, in existence today. But ontologies are more expressive ways of modeling things. So if you, if you think of the weather vocabulary and the weather ontology, the weather ontology is a more richer exp, uh, expression of the f weather phenomena. So most of the uh, uh, annotations that we'll be talking about today are made for ontologies. Now, Dr. Seth, uh, did some work in 1996, the MREF, the, the metadata reference uh, work, uh, is according to this line of thought that, that is you can annotate this web data and link them to ontologies to make more sense of it. Now, all these annotations that we are talking about, these, uh, these annotations to ontologies, we usually refer to them as semantic annotations because they add this uh, semantic data or, or, or semantic uh, uh, relevance to whatever the data that you're talking about. Now, when, when we go, go forward, you'll see exactly what and how we do it. Now, uh, there are the theme of our discussion, basically, in this, uh, this one, is semantic annotations for the web. And r if, you, if you look at the web, or at least the web in terms of annotating it, there are two webs that is sort of intertwined together. One web is this web for the humans. Like, you know, when you go to CNN, that's a human readable page with, you know, videos, pictures, you know, highlights of the day and all that. Now, there is a, a different version of the web that was that is meant for machines computers to process. So if you if you take the RSS feeds from CNN, they were not really ma made for a human. They're just, you know, a bunch of XMLs, data. And, and it was meant for an RSS reader. So if you have your favorite RSS reader, maybe Google's reader, Thunderbird, or any other, 
configured to read CNN, whatever the, that application shows up that data in its own format, not exactly how CNN shows it. So, so there is a web that is meant for the machines. There is a web that is meant for the humans, and this this machine uh, uh, targeted web has sort of evolved a lot in the last few years. So we are going to talk in 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 both senses of how do we annotate this human web and how do you do annotations on the machine web, both. Um, yes. Why why is it interesting again? So we talked about you know real world annotations. We we know that if when you make a circle on your note and say oh this is about uh, ontologies, so it's going to be useful to you. What is the use case to do it in the web? So one. Uh, motivating factor is that you could do better search. So when you search, your search results may uh, show up nicely, or you may be able to do more meaningful searches, right? And then there are these things called mashups. So, so I'll, if if you don't know the word mashup, we'll come to that later. Very, uh, I mean, you might have heard of it, but. At least the sense that we are talking about here, we'll get to that very soon. So it, it may give you the chance to do these mashups, so service compositions, much more easier and much more rapidly. And in general, it will make more automated stuff. So there will be certain programs that can you know, grab you things very easily and in an automated way with least human uh, involvement when you have all this metadata with you. Right? That's why it's interesting to us. That's why it's interesting to us to link these models with whatever the data we have. Okay, so uh, here's a quick motivating example. You might have heard of it. It's called, ya there's a Yahoo uh, search thing called Yahoo Search Monkey. So what Search Monkey does is that it makes your, your web page comes up in Yahoo search results in a really, really nice way. Now, uh, how do they do it? They ask you to do certain annotations, basically what we call RDFA, and we'll come to RDFA very soon. But uh, how they do it? They ask you to put these little annotations, and the motivation for you to do that, do that work is that it appears in Yahoo really, really nicely. So something like this. So if, if you just uh, do this search, whatever the, the, the movie name, if we did not have the annotations, the search engine might not know what is the MP which piece of string is telling you about the MPAA rating, and which piece of uh, string talks about uh, the the running time of the movie. Because there could be many times, right? I mean, you 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 can do a guess if it's not annotated, but when it's annotated, it's more clear, expressive, very. Uh, uh, simple but to extract. The point is that original information may have a somewhat different format, but this, you know, and if you go to actual page, may have a little different. But this yes. is exactly how you want the results to be displayed. Right. So you're providing the metadata that allows uh, the search engine to decide uh, to, to to kind of uh, display the results as uh, the content provider thinks would best, uh, you know, present the details. Right. Now. Uh, here, here's a quick, quick take of uh, annotating the human web. So there is this thing called RDFA. So as as you probably would uh, notice, A stands for annotations. Now the, it's it's A uh, W3C specification. So it's it's been uh, well discussed and you know being iterated over and over. And the the simplest idea of RDFA is that you put these annotations, little pieces of information inside the HTML. Now, here's a quick take of it. So, so if, if you know a bit about uh, HTML, these span tags, right? They, they actually don't do anything unless you do any, something with the CSS. So unless you ask the CSS to display spans differently, spans will have no effect. So what these people do is that they, they, they wrap these interesting pieces of uh, uh, items in span tags and give them link, uh, give them uh, pointers saying, okay, this word Bob refers to 
a or uh, is a creator of this resource so this this little p uh, web page uh, is about uh, a photo so there's a small comment on the photo there there is the actual picture and then the, there there are these little pieces of text that comes to the picture so rather than just putting the text as it is you wrap them with these pan tags and put these uh, little things called dc creator dc title so on so on making it much more meaningful for any any anything that understands this if the browser doesn't understand it fine it will just show up as regular text right now here's a uh, example much closer to home our people page in the noises lab is actually rdfa annotated so if you we are actually working on this uh, uh, right now meaning that we we are building much uh, better uh, uh, interface to this one but when you look at this listing uh, it's just a plain web page right you don't actually notice that it's quite special but there are these hidden annotations in this page how you can uh, you make use of these annotations is there are parsers that are capable of extracting these annotations and making ontologies making sense of the annotation. So this RDFA distiller from W3C is one of those. So if I actually give my noises uh, people's page uh, URL and ask it to uh, do something, and you will see that uh, it generated this nice ontology by looking at uh, this uh, web page. It could do this because we had these annotations embedded saying, okay, Amit Chet is a person, Ajit is a person, and uh, we are linked in this way, and so on and so on. So the whole web page carried this inf information in bits and pieces of annotations. So uh, let's get back to the... Okay, there's my... Now you can clearly uh, start to kind of imagine the value of uh, similar annotations on the sensor data. That's where we want to get to. So the idea would be that we have ontologies for sensor. Uh, you looked at uh, part of the ontology, but you can talk about time and geography related ontologies, space, special information. With regards to those ontologies, you can make annotations. That means all of the pieces of sensor data, rather than them being XML, or, 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 or in fact some proprietary format or XML, they become uh, meaningful in this context. And then you can ask, um, uh, very, you can very quickly pull together data from multiple sensors with some commonality in a particular thematic element, say uh, data from this location, data or at this time. All this kind of stuff can be made much more easy once you start rotating the sensor data. Yeah. Um, so I'm not really an RDFA expert, right? So if you if you are actually uh, interested in RDFA and if you want to know more information we have one of our experts uh, Pablo Mendez he is uh, he uh, interned twice at Yahoo and actually he worked with search monkey very very closely so he knows uh, RDFA sort of inside out I would say yeah, so he is our resident I would call him the resident RDFA expert uh, in noises so uh, moving on let's talk about what we are sort of uh, more familiar with that is uh, the, no, the noises lab, the noises services research lab in general. That is annotations of the machine web. Basically, how do you annotate these services? Now, before we actually move on, a small digression. When you look at the the, the services landscape, there is this ongoing debate about what type of services so it's it's a popularly known as the soap versus rest debate so what soap stands for at least what it used to stand for is simple object access protocol and when, when the the first version of the spec came out they actually called it simple object access protocol and then they realized that it's neither simple it not just does no, nothing with objects and it's not really a protocol so they dropped the acronym but kept the word SOAP still. So it's no longer called simple object access protocol, it's just called SOAP. But what it is, is a, a sort of a, a stack definition for uh, wrapping messages. That is, uh, so, so the SOAP stack has a whole slew of specifications. So you basically say, 
how do you define services in SOAP, how do you secure services in SOAP, how do you uh, reliably deliver messages in SOAP. So all these bits and pieces, there's a separate specification. So there's something called WS security, there's something called WS reliable messaging. So all this is uh, a ecosystem for enterprise class, you know, services. Slightly on the heavy side, I would say. And uh, there was a time, like about five years ago, that people thought this is the future. And that sort of slowly died away, and then nobody thinks that it's a silver arrow right now. The other, the proponents of soap, uh, sorry, the opponents of soap are the REST people. So REST actually stands for representational state transfer. It's not really a protocol, but it's a, it's a, uh, paradigm. So basically what, in very simple terms, what REST means is that you, you have these resources and you manipulate these resources with four basic operators. So get, put, post and delete. And HTTP is a implementation of this REST paradigm. So the people who uh, uh, proposed REST as opposed to uh, uh, SOAP so that, okay, there, there are these interesting things that you can do because th there is already a bustling uh, uh, infrastructure for, uh, so H for HTTP. If you want an HTTP server, there you can Apache, Tomcat, there's a whole lot of well-known HTTP servers and it's, it's uh, the, the, the network supported and there's a lot of ground, a lot of uh, groundwork done for HTTP already. So they, they, uh, uh, they, are, they propose that rather than going the ex SOAP way, you just drop all the overhead and use the plain HTTP. So this, the, the problems with REST is that it's not really well defined, right? Meaning that there's no uh, uh, agreed upon description mechanism for REST services. Right now what you get is these pages and pages of HTML text that tells people how to program for it, right? And not really a, a formal definition of what the service is. And then uh, it's mostly consumer centric, meaning that uh, enterprises don't like to use them. Why? Because they may not be secure, they may not, they may have performance issues, they may not have certain uh, reliability guarantees. So enterprises somewhat prefer SOAP and uh, consumers like somebody who's say uh, making a little web page and want to uh, embed uh, a Google search box or a Google map would prefer a fresh type of service. Now, we are, when we go to the SOAP world, right, there is something called WSDL. So this is pronounced as WSDL. WSDL stands for Web Service Definition Language. Now a WSDL is like a description or a, a formal description of a web soap based web service. Now the catch here is that they actually made WSDL compatible with REST so you can even define a REST service with, with, with uh, uh, WSDL but the proponent, uh, the, the, the guys who proposed REST were completely opposed of anything that adds burden. So they never accepted the, the capabilities of WSDL to define and uh, formalize REST services. Uh, and uh, they, 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 there were some attempts to formalize them, but nothing sort of gained ground. Now here's uh, the, the, the interesting thing about these WSDL files is that it's somewhat of a complete description of your service. It is complete to the extent that you can actually point to the WSDL file and say, generate code for me to access this service. Now if you if you if you are in a .NET environment or a Java environment, there are many code generators that you can use with these whistle files. So when you point your code generator to the whistle file, it will generate code that will act, that you can use to access your web service. So it's that much of a uh, uh, complete description of the service. Now here's a, let me actually show you an example uh, WSDL. So here Here's it's it's an XML file basically. I hope you can see it. Yes. So 
there are these namespaces and all that and then there are several sections but there's one section called the types section which is an XML schema that uh, defines what kind of message types are there and then there's a description of messages and then there are these two things called the port type and the binding so this is more like the uh, I hope you guys understand uh, object oriented programming at least to some extent yeah. so it's it's more like the interface and the 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 implementation right so the port type is like the interface it says it has these 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 methods but it doesn't say how it's accessed where it's where it is at the binding actually says okay that this service you need to use this type of format to access it and this is how it's concretized so so we we, are, we don't need to actually go into details with uh, this uh, WSDL it's uh, it's not actually meant for humans either it's uh, meant for mostly machines but the point is that there are some sections that actually defines the interface and there are sections basically the binding and the service that defines the implementation so if you actually want to generate code you need the full WSDL which has the binding and the service because uh, without them the there would be no sense of the visual it's just like the Java interface and the Java class the implementation class of course the interface uh, is good enough if you want to know what it does but when you when it actually comes to doing some work it doesn't make any sense only to have the interface right so just like that right now uh, when we uh, go further of annotating these we come to what we call source del. so if you guessed SA stands for something it is probably right SA stands for semantic annotations and uh, this was a 